Hi, everybody. I want to start by telling you my, about my weekend two weeks ago. Uh, we had, I, I got home from work at about 5 o'clock on Friday. And I had a board of directors meeting that day and had spent about two weeks preparing for this. It's a really important meeting. And when I pulled in the driveway that day, my, my brain was not on what I was doing that weekend. It was, it was still at work. But I was very excited about that weekend because I was going camping with my nine-year-old son. We were going on a winter camp out. And so over the next 30 minutes, I very hurriedly throwed, threw a whole bunch of clothes that I never wear into bags that I never use and took my, took my son's clothes and we threw them in the car and, and off we went. And over the next day or so, we did all the wonderful things that you do on a winter camp out. We cut wood, uh, we went snowshoeing, we went cross country skiing. And we had a blast until about 5.08 p.m. on Saturday when I realized that my car keys, my, my new car keys, which are much bigger than my old car keys, which fit right here perfectly, and I always had them here, and I still haven't worked out the rhythm of where I keep my new car keys, were, were gone. And despite my best efforts to find those car keys, uh, they were nowhere to be found. And I ended up that day with a very bad outcome. Uh, and the very bad outcome in that case was, uh, was a very uh, uh, agitated spouse, my wife. And, and I think we can all relate to this story, that we can look back when something bad happens, in hindsight being 2020, and, and say, gosh, I should have predicted that. I should have known that because I was hurried, I was distracted, I was using some new tools, I was in an unfamiliar situation, that something bad could have happened. And so many times when, we, when we're saying that, it's about a workplace accident. It's where somebody has gotten killed at work and we're looking back and we're saying, ah, we should have connected the dots. And so what I want to talk to you about today is, is I want to talk to you about how we've been trying to end death on the job. And I want to talk about trying to predict accidents in the future, taking the things that we've all learned from Moneyball and from Nate Silver of 538 and applying those to, to the very serious epidemic of, of workplace fatalities. And I want to start off in Pittsburgh. Many of us know Pittsburgh, this wonderful city we love so much. Uh, for the innovations that it's delivered in medicine and technology uh, and materials. Uh, and, and we know what Pittsburgh was like about 100 years ago at the turn of the century. It was full of steel mills and rail yards and tanneries. Uh, it was underlaid with coal mines everywhere. And it was into this cauldron of industry uh, that a, a young Boston lawyer named Crystal Eastman came. She moved to Pittsburgh in 1907. And over the course of the next couple of years, Crystal Eastman studied a series of workplace fatalities that occurred between July of 1906 and June of 1907. 526 people lost their lives in Allegheny County in that 12-month span. And the result of, of her research was a book called uh, Work Accidents in the Law. Uh, it's an amazing book. It's available on Google Docs. I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, and in it, she outlines uh, the societal impact of workplace fatalities. Uh, and she also talks about what we need to do to end it. And it, at that time, at the early part of the last century, there was a, there was a rising consciousness about the workplace and, and what the workplace should be and shouldn't be. Uh, in 1907, Upton Sinclair wrote the novel The Jungle that outlined the deplorable conditions that uh, immigrant laborers were faced with in Chicago meatpacking. Uh, the American Society of Safety Engineers started in 1911. The National Safety Council started in 1913. And so we, as a country, were becoming more aware of, of this epidemic. And what Crystal Eastman said was protection. We want to employ a strategy of protection, protecting people with laws, protecting people with uh, technology, with engineering, with construction. And she tells a great story in it about rail car couplings. And prior to 1893, rail cars did not automatically connect. A, 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 a railman or a brakeman had to go out and actually pin these, uh, pin these cars together. And the government passed a law in 1893 that mandated automatic rail car couplings. That when they connected, if you were going to run trains on US tracks, they had to have automatic connectors. So a combination of law and technology. And an amazing thing happened. 
fatalities among uh, rail yard workers. Amidst rising injuries and fatalities among trainmen, which is the top two lines, uh, trainmen involved in coupling accidents dropped to virtually nothing. And she said, go do a whole bunch of that. Go, go find all those opportunities that you can find where you can combine these things and help send people home alive at the end of the day. And this is one of the great stories she tells in this book. And so over the last hundred years, we've been doing that. And by any measure you look at, productivity, uh, safety, fatalities, et cetera, we are a much safer place today than we were a hundred years ago. But a very sad story is that a hundred years almost to the day after the publication of Work Accidents and the Law, the Upper Big Branch Mine, which is just a couple hours drive south of here, uh, blew up. I think we all know about that. And it killed 29 men that day in April, that spring day. And on that same day, April 5th, 2010, three other people, a welder in Indiana, a logger in Louisiana, and an oil field worker in North Dakota were killed in separate workplace accidents. And all of the progress that we've made as a society over the last 100 years meant absolutely nothing to those 32 people that lost their lives that day. All that progress failed to keep them alive and send them home alive to their families at the end of the day. And when we look at the last 20 years in comparison to the last 100, the story isn't so great. We can do high fives over the progress we've made in the last century, but those of us, we talked about being born into technology, and I, I like to think of, uh, we, we get used to things like Moore's Law, where we talk about the acceleration of computing. And when we see a chart that looks like this, that, that, I don't get very excited about the slope of that line. 18 times each workday, somebody is getting a phone call that a loved one's not coming home from work. 88 times a week. And just to help calibrate you on that number, that 4,606 number uh, for 2011, there, there's been roughly 4,500 service people killed in Iraq in the last 10 years. So take that every single year in workplace accidents. And the other thing that, that we also have less reason to get excited about the slope of this is that when you overlay a trailing three-year GDP growth curve on it, it's hard to even get, you get even less excited about it. And you can make a very strong case that, that it, when the economy is healthy and robust and we're building new buildings and we're adding to plants and generating economic growth, more people are getting killed. But when it cools off a little bit, fewer people are dying. So the question is, how do we create a new inflection point? And I, I go back to my key story. Is, is there a lesson in me losing my keys? And this is a great quote that I like because it talks about that principle. In almost every accident we see, we see precursors. We see things that could have predicted that this was going to happen. And so that's the question that we've been trying to answer over the last five years at Industrial Scientific, is can we predict and prevent workplace accidents? And in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University, we've been building uh, an algorithm model that's based on crowdsourcing safety inspections. Today we have over 130 million safety inspections. We have 45,000 accidents in our database. We've been building and training a model that we can apply and to see if we can predict workplace accidents. And, and the answer is a very promising yes. We, we, we can, we're off to a great start. And, and at this stage, what we've built it into is something we call a red flag model. It's just like a check engine light, almost, is the, is the easiest analogy. That if you have your departments or your teams and, and, and you get a red flag on it, you have about a 60% chance of having an accident or a significantly increased rate of accidents in the next 30 days. If you don't get red flagged, you have, a, you, you have about a 90% chance of no change or no accidents in the next 30, next 30 days. So we can look at prediction from very complex algorithms that we train repeatedly, that we build and train and add data to uh, and continue to increase. But the other great thing is that, is that it doesn't take very complex models to use analytics to make people safer. And one of the, one of the stories I love is that of uh, uh, the 1856, there was in, in London, in central London, 
1856, there was a cholera outbreak. 500 people died in 10 days. It, it, was, it was an absolute epidemic. And, and a doctor named John Snow was called in to, to investigate, to try to help and, and figure out what, what was going on. Uh, and what he did was very simply plot each death graphically on a map. And that's what each of these little tick points is. And he said he, he had a street corner revelation looking at that, that all of those data points centered on the Broad Street pump. They pulled the handle off of the Broad Street water pump, and instantly the cholera epidemic stopped. So it isn't wrong. We're not talking about super sophisticated algorithms and models here to do that. And we see that today even. In part of our business, we do, we have, we do gas detection equipment. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world wearing our instruments to warn them when there's a potentially dangerous atmosphere. In a, in a story that repeats itself over and over again, and I'm going to use a specific example of a customer we were working with, they have about 1,000 people across the world wearing gas detectors. And they had about 7,000 gas alarms last year. And on the, on, the, on the face of it, you look at it and you say, hey, you know, about seven alarms per person, that's, that's pretty good when you look at it averages. But when you scratch it one surface deeper, you see that 998 of those employees had an average of about six alarms, so still not a different story, but two of them had an average of 350 gas alarms in that year. And this is the kind of stuff that I think we as a society have gotten used to finding out about after there's a fatality and an investigation. And all too often we're connecting the dots when, when there's a, a family member who's been killed at work. And we need to connect those dots before that happens. So when I think about the next 20 years and, and, the, and, the, and the lack of progress that we've seen in the past 20 years and what we need to do with the mobile-enabled world that we have, the promise of big data and analytics, uh, the ability to get more data, more diverse data, uh, uh, data that tells better stories, if we don't drive a significant downturn in the workplace fatality rate, certainly in the US and, and globally, uh, we as a society have, have failed. We've absolutely failed. And we're working hard to, to make sure that we're driving that inflection point using data. So I've talked about data. I want to conclude uh, with one other thing that I think is very important that we need to be doing. And, and that's elevating the worker safety movement. And I think we do this from a couple different angles. The first is from a logical angle, that we need to elevate worker safety. The word supply chain management uh, was first used in 1982 and, was, and it didn't gain acceptance really until the mid-90s. Uh, but companies had been doing it since the beginning of time. But suddenly there was this new term that people could rally around. We're going to do supply chain management better. And companies found that they could get a tremendous competitive advantage by doing that really well. And I think that that's a very good analogy for what the safety industry and movement is in today, is where it is right now is that it needs to rally around a new elevated level uh, of capability to make businesses uh, better overall. And the second thing involves our hearts. We simply need to be more outraged by this. Every April 28th, Workers Memorial Day comes. And there may be a sentence or two in the newspaper about it. This needs to be something that we know about. And I want to conclude by bringing back Crystal Eastman that I talked about before. And this is what I mean by outrage. When Crystal Eastman wrote this book in 1910, she didn't have the right to vote. I don't know if you know that. You know, women did not have the right to vote in the US until 1919. And we sit here, and I saw a bunch of you laugh. We laugh. We can't imagine that world today. That was less than 100 years ago. And it's that same level of, of disbelief, of, of, of pain, and of outrage that we need to take every time we read in the newspaper that somebody was killed at work, every time we hear about it, the expectations that you go out of here uh, and take to your jobs in the level of safety that you have there. Every man and woman that gets up and goes to work to provide for their family deserves as a fundamental human right to come home alive at the end of the day. Thank you.